Hello. We come to week 16, Theodosius I and the Council of Constantinople. Um, let me start by saying first that Theodosius I is a major figure in the early life of the church who seems to have completely disappeared from the general imagination of people who think about the early church. And um, that's a great loss in our um, ability to understand what actually went on. He, um, he is a tremendously important figure and um, one who should be better known. Is that better? No. Sorry. There is no perfect way to do this, I have discovered over the years. Um, so let us begin. Um, when the Goths kill Valens at the Battle of Adrianople, um, then um, Theodosius is put into power by the ruler of the West. Uh, and so he comes into control of the eastern part of the empire and um, eventually in control of the entire empire. The um, Western emperor is done away with by his palace guard. Um, at a young age. Um, one of the things that's important to keep in mind, we're going to again spend most of our time looking at the original sources. I've tried to um, pare those down to a very few so we'd have some time to really talk about them. Um, but one of the things I'd like to say first is, um, beginning here on page 162 in Hall's book, is to remind you of the fact that as I have tried to uh, make clear up till now, and as the history that we're going to cover is going to make even more clear, just agreeing with the Nicene Creed, even if you understand the Nicene Creed properly, just agreeing with the Nicene Creed does not mean that you are going to be in agreement with everyone else who likes the Nicene Creed, and it also does not mean that you are going to be a holder of what we would call Orthodox Catholic theological positions. For example, um, the, the Nicene versus Arian argument, as we've said a number of times, is over the whether or not the church is preaching a full incarnation of a fully divine son as Jesus of Nazareth. The Nicene Creed, true God from true God, being the most important phrase, pushes that idea. But it is possible to push that, to agree with that idea, and not be a Catholic Christian, at least according to our understanding, as people like Apollinaris of Laodicea demonstrate, right? So that the, um, it is, in important ways, it is true to say what a number of famous scholars of the early church say which is that the Nicene Creed is not actually the end of a conversation, but rather the beginning of a conversation. Um, if I had a blackboard, I would draw a square on a blackboard and say, and we'll say the same thing about Chalcedon too, and say that a definition, the, the true meaning of the Latin word definition, is something that puts boundaries to something. So, uh, for example, a surveyor defines a piece of land on the ground. That's exactly this. As a matter of fact, that's the original use of the term. right? And then it gets used metaphorically for things like creeds. Um, the creed is a definition of the church's teaching, but that does not mean it pins it down like a butterfly on a piece of paper. It means it draws boundaries around it. And as anyone who got through as much math as I did, which was not very much, knows there are an infinite number of points in any enclosed space because points take up no space. So there are an infinite number of positions that could be, potential positions, that could be uh, promulgated that would be in tune with the Nicene Creed. Not all of those are going to be necessarily what the church intends when it's producing the Nicene Creed. And Apollinaris is completely Nicene 
in, he's a very good theologian. He's highly intelligent, well-educated, well-meaning. He's very honest about all of this. He's not one of those who tries to hide what he thinks, right? Um, but his position, which is of a, um, of a, an incarnate Lord who is not fully human in the way that we are fully human, is not what the Catholic Church intends, though it is allowed by the Nicene Creed, which is, of course, why we get more councils later. So um, it's very important to understand the divisions in the East among Nicene, some of which are jurisdictional. The long, endless Meletian schism in Antioch that scholars have beaten each other metaphorically to death over for centuries and still there is not general agreement on what actually happened let alone what it meant um, we don't I think we don't have enough information to really know so I try to stay clear of that one um, is an example of a disagreement among people who seems seem to have agreed theologically but disagreed over who was going to be in charge of Antioch um, which at the time to them was a tremendously important question to me I must admit that my concern over who's exactly going to be in charge of the Church of Antioch in the 370s and 60s is for, for me it seems kind of like a minor point um, to them it didn't and greater minds than mine exercise themselves um, extensively over that question for decades. The Church of Con the Council of Constantinople, um, there is um, there are a few things to say about this. Um, the first thing here beginning on page 165, the first thing to remember is that Constantinople like Nicaea is a tremendously important council about which we know very little. Uh, we do not, we, we know more perhaps than we know about Nicaea because we know virtually nothing about Nicaea, but it's not like later ecumenical councils like, for example, Chalcedon or even First Ephesus, about which we know quite a bit more than we do about um, Constantinople. The canons of Constantinople, like the canons of virtually all early councils, are almost entirely disciplinary. There were clearly centuries-long struggles to successfully organize the practicalities of the life of the church. This difficulty, which continues up to the present day, a lot of people think that, you know, it's not very religious to spend all your time at church meetings talking about things like finance. And I must admit that when I'm in meetings like that, I have, I do not have a sense of tremendous religious uplift, but um, the experience of the church over time has taught us that these things are necessary. And if you look back at these great, you know, great ecumenical councils that we remember for theological reasons, it seems perfectly clear that almost all of their time and effort was spent on things that are really not very uplifting. Um, that's just the way life is in a fallen world. Um, more about the creed. When we look at the creed, um, the first thing to say about the creed, which is really very important, really the last thing I'd like to say before we start looking at the original things, beginning here on page 167, it's tremendously important to know we get the creed we get what we are told is the creed of the Council of Constantinople from the Council of Chalcedon. We just, we don't know about the Council directly. Um, and that's very important to know. Uh, the creed of the Council of Constantinople comes into our view out of a out of a void um, it just it appears at the um, council of chalcedon and is read into the record uh, which is where our text of it comes from 
and uh, all we really know about it is what we can tell from looking at it and from what the Council of Chalcedon tells us, which is not nearly as much as we would like to know and also not particularly the things about it that we would like to know. So, um, you know, it's not as much or the, it's not the right stuff. Not only is it not as much, but it's also not the right stuff. Okay, um, so let's begin with our original sources with number 88, Greg, Gregory Nazianzus at Constantinople. Um, Gregory Nazianzus is, uh, I believe, a fundamental figure in the life of the church. Um, theologically speaking, he's much more important than people who are much better known in the West, like Augustine. Um, he's, he's tremendously important for the development of the church's expression of its belief about um, the Trinitarian God and also about Jesus, um, the Incarnate Word. Um, I urge all of you to make some study of his um, most important things, which are the theological letters and the um, and the theological orations. Um, all of Gregory Nazianzus' orations are now in English. Um, I don't believe that I have sent you a bibliography of him. I don't know that I will. Um, if you go on Amazon.com, you can discover all of his stuff very easily. The um, St. Vladimir Seminary Press people are publishing um, volumes of his stuff, which are easy to get and relatively inexpensive. Um, let, me t let, let me tell you a little bit about Gregory before we begin, just so you'll know. Um, my doctoral dissertation was on a comparison of Gregory and Ephraim the Syrian as arguers against the Arians. So this is something that I've spent some time on. Um, Gregory is born uh, from a, an upper-class family in Cappadocia, um, what you would call sort of regional gentry. I mean, local people in Cappadocia think that they're relatively fancy. They don't seem to have been tremendously wealthy. They're certainly not important on an imperial scale. You know, when someone like Gregory Nazianzus goes to the capital, Constantinople. Nobody's ever heard of him. Nobody's ever heard of his family. Probably he has to spend a long time. If someone asks him, where are you from? It probably takes him quite a long time to tell them where he's from for them to figure out. You know, it's like being the most important person in southwestern Kansas and getting to New York City, and people are not all that impressed. Um, he, uh, however, um, is from a very well-educated family, and he receives the best education available in the Roman world at the time, both secular and Christian. He studies in Athens, which is one of his fellow students is Julian, later the emperor, so he's clearly studying with, you know, the top-ranked people. He also studies extensively in Caesarea at the library that um, Eusebius of Caesarea had set up, and the one that Origen had been involved in. He's a great devotee of Origen and um, was certainly had access to Origen's original collection of works that were in that library. So therefore many things of Origen that were lost to us are known to him. Um, he was very retiring, um, was not interested in ecclesiastical politics, went back to his hometown um, and wanted to just be left alone to lead an ascetic life and to study. His father, who had been elected the bishop of the local church, essentially forcibly elected him to the priesthood so that he would have some help in the local church. We have no idea how large this was. It's very likely it was on the scale of, a, of an APCK church. Um, in other words, you know, a couple dozen people maybe. Um, after... Basil, his friend, became Bishop of Caesarea in Cappadocia, trying to get a firmer grasp on the church in his own part of the world. Basil essentially forcibly uh, consecrated Gregory, the Bishop of Sassima, which, uh, as far as we know, he never even visited. 
um, in order to have another bishop that he could pull forward at meetings and you know would vote with him. Uh, Gregory went back to his hometown and tried to sort of pretend it hadn't happened. Um, at some point quite late in the Aryan um, ascendancy in the East, the Nicene, some members of the Nicene community in Constantinople, and there was a Nicene community that was meeting by itself and worshiping by itself, despite the fact that the cathedral and the, you know, the court was all about the, um, all about the Aryan stuff. Uh, that community asked Gregory to come and uh, be their leader, their liturgical leader. Uh, they spent their time in this church called the um, Resurrection Anastasia, um, which is what you see here in Selection 88. Um, it seems to have been probably the chapel in an important wealthy person's house rather than an actual parish church. In other words, it was it was a completely sort of underground, at least officially, I'm sure that the government knew they were there, but officially underground operation. Um, this is actually the community to whom Gregory preached some of the greatest sermons in Christian history, including the entire five sermon sequence that we call the theological orations, which are 27 through 31 in his collection. Um, those five sermons are absolutely fundamental for the development of Christian theology. Anyone who is going to study uh, the early Christian thought, really anyone who is going to study Christian doctrine should read them. They're in print in English. This little book from St. Vladimir's Press, let me see if I can make it so you can see it. Um, Gregory Nazianzus, On God and Christ, The Five Theological Orations and the Two Letters to Cladonius is available in print. Um, this is the best translation into English that's been done so far. Um, and uh, it, it has good notes. It's 2002. That This is the, the book that everyone should get and everyone should read. Um, it's, it, it, it includes his Christological stuff, the two letters to Cladonius, or the letters against Apollinaris, and the five theological orations. Um, so I urge you to do that. Um, what's really interesting about... Um, this sequence, the reason why I'm spending so much time on this sequence, is that um, the first thing it shows you is that there was great intellectual power on the Catholic side of this whole um, mishmash of different groups. Um, that that better? I don't know if that's better or worse. No, that's a little better. Um, that uh, that the response of the Catholics in the capital city, Constantinople, to the situation of being pushed aside and kept out of the public life of the you know the life of the church that was allowed at least in the capital by the government was to respond intellectually by propounding their own beliefs rather than, for example, by running away from the capital where the government, you know, where the government controlled the church most directly, or um, going, going into negative, negative ways of, you know, at attacking the Aryans with vituperation. Um, you could read the theological orations and not be really aware that they come from a period of great theological conflict. They're, they are a positive statement. 
of doctrine and everything else aside because we live in an era which is so mixed up theologically and ecclesiologically and because we are part of a theological you know a, a um an historical stream in the church the anglican stream which is so mixed up and in a lot of ways so messed up um i think it's very important for us to see that um when you put one of the greatest minds in the church in that situation what he does is proclaim the gospel rather than worry about what anyone else is doing um, and, and I think that's, in a, in a nutshell, one of the great lessons that the early church can show us, that the way, to, um, the way forward is a constructive way rather than a destructive way. Let's look at the um, Creed of Constantinople here on page 133. Um, it's very interesting, of course, that they give you the Greek at the same time. One of the things that shows is that it's, it's always a little bit tricky. Uh, translating creeds into another language because of course creeds are meant to um, be such brief encapsulations that they always have a lot of stuff which is sort of implicit in them and it's quite difficult to trans translate creeds into other languages without either leaving too much out or putting too much in Anyway, just as another note, I mentioned before the fact that German scholars are involved in um, a major multi-year, multi-scholar project to try to identify and collect all of the passages of the rule of faith slash creedal material from the early church. And I can't remember how far they're going to go up. That When I saw them present five years ago at Oxford, they were still in the process of arguing with each other, even during the meeting, about how far forward they were going to go in time. They're certainly going to go up to Chalcedon. They'll probably go after that, and who knows. But um, that will be the project that will enable me to be certain that what I'm about to say is accurate. Um, I'm... As far as I know, up till now, there are no known examples of the writing of the Creed of Constantinople, or what we would call the Niceno-Constantinopolitan Creed, between 381 and 451, the time of the Council of Chalcedon. Um, it would be it would be tremendously helpful to us to discover some times when this creed is actually written out in by someone in the church in those 70 years in between but as far as I know there's never been one discovered so when I said before we don't get the creed of Constantinople until Chalcedon that's as far as I know now um, I believe it's going to turn out to be right because that's certainly one of the things that they've been looking for. Five years ago, they had not found one. One year ago, at the next Oxford conference, they did not give a presentation. I think they would have given a presentation if they'd found an example of that, because that's the kind of thing that might really help us see the, the history of this period more clearly because that has not been reported, and I didn't hear any rumors around, you know, the coffee machine. Um, I think that probably that will hold true, and as far as the material that survives for us now, we don't see this creed until Chalcedon. But I can't say that that's settled yet, right? Um, but I, th I, think it's, I think it's pretty safe to say. Okay, so what is... What do we really see? Phrases that do not appear, appear in the Creed of Nicaea are italicized in the right-hand column here. So what do we not see? We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. The heaven and earth is a new thing, and of all things, the invisible and the invisible. In one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God. So it, that 
that just seems to be a fuller, more scriptural rendering of the same idea. It doesn't seem to change the content, right? The change of the meaning. Okay. The only begotten Son of God, begotten from the Father before all ages or before all worlds, as our creed sometimes said. The um, before all ion, ion ages, ions. Um, it's a word that has a lot of different uses in ancient Greek philosophical and theological. Um, eon is the word, um, and it can be used of long blocks of time in our created level as we do, but it also can mean higher levels. If you're a Gnostic, you believe in lots of ions going up sort of to the highest level at which the Creator lives. Um, by saying, begotten from the Father before all ages, it means there is no kind of reality and no period of things existing before the Son is begotten. So one of the things this insists on, it's a way of emphasizing the fact that the Son is begotten before there is any creation going on. So the Son is prior to all of creation. Right? So when we say, so when it goes on to say, through whom all things came into existence farther down, that that's emphasized, it means he is the agent through whom everything is created. Heavenly realities as well as earthly realities. And um, that's making an even more determined distinction between what Gnostic or Platonic people would say that they're all these sort of you know, emanations of levels of creation that we talked about at the very beginning um, of the class. That all of that stuff, whatever there is, however you want to think about the created world, all of that is after the sun and through the sun, by means of the sun. Okay. So, who because of us men... And, uh, well, we're, we're skipping through. You see, the true God from true God begotten, not made of one substance through the Father, through all things came into existence. All of that sort of core Nicene stuff is exactly the same, um, which is one of the reasons why it's it's fair to call this the Niceno-Constantinopolitan Creed, because that's really the Christological heart of this. Um, okay, that he comes down from the heavens, just making clear that he's coming from being personally present with the Father in a particular way to come down on earth and was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, um, which just emphasizing again clearly that there's a divine actor and a human actor, if, if the conceiving mother can be called an actor, the, a divine actor and human actor um, involved in this. They're beginning what's going to be a very standard thing, a very clear balancing. Later we'll see, I think, in this book, it gets to be quite common for people to say, begotten from the God the Father, without a mother, conceived by the Virgin Mary, without a human father. So there's sort of a one, you know, on one nature one thing is happening and the other nature another thing is happening that's um that's that kind of idea of balance is beginning here with from the holy spirit and the virgin mary crucified for us under pontius pilate which emphasizes the historical reality of this which again is another way of emphasizing incarnation suffered and was buried that he goes through the whole physical process and um, rose again on the third day according to the scriptures. Um, as I've said before, um, maker of heaven and earth, for us under Pontius Pilate, was buried according to the scriptures. All of those really are additions that, that more completely tie the details of the creed to the Bible even than they were before. We saw before when we looked at the Nicene Creed how, and earlier creeds, how so many of the things they say are pulled directly out of Scripture. Um, this has always been true, but these additions in the Constantinopolitan Creed seem to be designed to emphasize that scriptural base. We've seen all through the Arian controversy, even the most Catholic, according to our understanding, bishops, 
very nervous about using anything in the creed that's not obviously right out of the Bible. And so since they've got the homoousios phrase in there, which is always a problem for Greek-speaking bishops because it's not scriptural, they, by making the rest of the creed seem more scriptural, it makes things easier. As people who do Syriac Christianity point out, in, in Syriac, all of the words of the creed are scriptural. They don't have this problem. Usios, usia, is not a word that appears in the Greek Bible. Believe me, everybody looked, right? They were looking desperately to try to find precedent, and it's not there. The words that are used in Syriac are all there. So the Syrians don't have the same argument over the creed that the Greeks do because their warning bells don't go off the same way the Greeks' warning bells do. Their creeds are just as scriptural, if not more scriptural, than the Greeks, though. That's Christians always like that. Okay, and sits on the right hand of the Father, which is also a, um, a good Book of Revelation thing. And will come with again with glory, because he's, you know, glory belongs to God, so they're, they're emphasizing the divinity, to judge the living and the dead, of whose kingdom there will be no end. That, because of Marcellus of Ansyra, who is a Nicene at the time, but is one of the people who's being pushed out by this creed. Marcellus seems to have taught that the kingdom of the sun was going to be for a time and then was going to be subsumed. And that made people worry about whether the sun was going to be subsumed. So is the sun really eternally begotten and eternally being begotten even now and into the future? And so as a protection of the Trinity being a constant, permanent, eternal reality, this phrase is added in, of whose kingdom there will be no end, because the ruler is the Son, and the Son has no end. Okay. And the Holy Spirit, and then you get this longer list of things. Almost all of the Holy Spirit stuff is added. All of this comes from the arguments with the Pneumatomachians, right, the spirit fighters that we read about last week and that who continue on for quite a while um, up to the present day, as I told you, even with a guy in my Hebrew class who was a spirit fighter, though he didn't know it till I told him. It didn't seem to matter to him much, but anyway, you try what you know, you know. Okay, the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father, not, and right, the filioque is a Western edition much later, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke through the prophets in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We confess one baptism to the remission of sins, look forward to the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. This part here, who pro the, the Lord and life giver, who proceeds from the Father, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke through the prophets, right? All of that is emphasizing things we know about the Holy Spirit. It seems very likely to me and a lot of other people that this list of things to say about the Holy Spirit is probably heavily influenced by Basil the Great's very important treatise on the Holy Spirit, which is also translated by the St. Vladimir's Seminary Press people. I won't bother to get the copy and hold it up for you. It says St. Basil on the Holy Spirit. Um, everyone should read that. Um, Basil tries to argue. Basil never says the Spirit is God, because ba Basil never says that, as we, as we said last time. But Basil tries to argue for the full and equal divinity of the Spirit by describing and delineating what the Spirit is said to do by the Scripture and saying, since these are divine acts, therefore we can see that the Scripture is teaching us that the Spirit is fully divine, even though the Spirit is never called God in the Bible. And that's clearly what this passage is doing. The Lord and life giver, Lord, of course, Kyrios being, you know, the Old Testament Greek word for Y-H-W-H, for the Lord. The Lord and life giver who proceeds from the Father, who with the Father and the Son is together worshipped and glorified who spake through the prophets. That's a summary list, a Cliff Notes version of 
what Basil pushes in his treatise on the Holy Spirit. Everyone should also read that. It's fundamental to the church's theological understanding of God. And it's tremendously important for arguing. You know, he's got a lot of grammar in there, and it gets after a while, since you know we already agree with him, after a while you think, come on, let's move on. But um, for people who don't, start off agreeing with him at the beginning it clearly seems to be necessary um one of the one of the basic arguments he's making is that the church's theology is found most dependably and most centrally in what the church says in worship this is still before written services right but he does quote from phrases of prayers um trying to argue that the church already believes that the Holy Spirit is fully and equally divine because look at the way we pray, right? So the, the theological principle, what becomes the, the a theological principle, that lex orandi statuat legem credendi, right? The rule of, the, the rule of praying establishes the rule of belief, which is what everyone always says, lex orandi, lex credendi, which is not the actual form of it, but that's okay. Um, that principle is set forward in its complete form. I think Basil is the first person to do that. So that that's a tremendously important. Um, that's a tremendously important treatise for people like us to read. Okay. Well, if that's sufficient um, for now then if you look at the canons of the of the council um, here I, I put them on your list um, because I wanted you to see two things first of all it's very interesting we get the canons in the creed in a letter to the emperor reporting this is what we did this is how we're going to organize the church which says a lot about the relationship between the civil government and the church. Theodosius being a Spaniard, a Latin-speaking Spaniard, who was a lifelong Nicene and um, to whom we owe a greater debt than we realize, um, was, there was no question what side of all these questions he was on, and he was calling a council together for it to do what it did, which was to promulgate and support the teaching of the Creed of Nicaea. Um, and all of these um, other things, um, which, if, if you look at these six, um, six canons that you're given, what you can see is that these are all attempts to bring order to the church. Um, church life without order quickly becomes unlivable, and it becomes impossible for the church to be an appropriate mouthpiece of the gospel if it doesn't speak with a un united voice, and if people in every place don't know who their bishop is. If you don't know who your bishop is, you don't know where your church is, right? As Peter says, where else shall we go? Because who else has the words of life, right? If the church has the words of life as Christ did, people need to know where it is. And um, that's what these canons, excuse me, are designed to protect. Um, even something that sounds to us completely sort of infighting jurisdictional, like number two, on page 135 here, bishops outside a diocese must not enter upon churches outside their own borders nor bring confusion into the churches. That is trying to make it possible for people in every locale to know where the authority is. If you look at the council, the council, if you look at the canons of the APCK, you will see that they're very strong on proper lines of authority and knowing who's in charge of what and why. Um, and that, as I said before, sometimes people think that that's not, you know, really uplifting. But as a matter of fact, it, it's tremendously important. Okay.
let's quickly look at um, some of these other things. We get a little bit um, of Basil here, 82 and 83. These passages are both from letters of his. We have a, f we have a four volume collection of letters, of his letters that survive. Um, very interesting for all sorts of things. From this period, one of the things I have skated over in talking to you about these things, which is going to come out later, but it's worth being warned ahead of time. Um, these two things here on pages 122 and 123, Basil is trying to lay out here as a part of developing an agreed-upon way of talking about the Trinity. In order to talk about the Trinity, you have to talk about, you have to have some way of speaking about in what way you think that God is one. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. The church is committed to that idea. And in what way you think the church is three, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. What are they? Right? If you're going to say, okay, well, we've got three, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, then the obvious question, the one you get in confirmation class, is three what? And if you say, well, God is one, hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one, the question is one what? Because you just said we had three. How can we have three and one? Well, the obvious answer and the philosophically responsible answer, which is the one that the Cappadocian Fathers work so hard on, is that the sense in which God is one must be in some way distinct from the sense in which God is three. So what are you going to say are the three things and what are you going to say is the one thing? Right? Um, so if you look at the beginning of 82 here on page 122, it is indispensable to have a clear understanding that as he who fails to confess the community of the essence, usia, fall, which is in both languages, essence is Latin and usia is Greek, in both languages that's from the verb to be, right? So it's what the modern translation of the, um, um, of the, Nicene Creed often says one in being, because that's from the verb to be, too. Right? Uh, the, the essence falls into polytheism. If you don't confess the community of the essence, if you don't say Father, Son, and Holy Spirit all have the same essence, then you've got multiple gods. You're a polytheist. But if you refuse to grant the distinction of the hypostases, then you end up a Jew. You end up with only one thing. Hypostasis... Their um, hypostasis is a word that has a lot of different meanings at this time. He is using it in the sense that we would use the English word thing. Uh, one of the ways you can use hypostasis is to say that this water bottle is a hypostasis, and so is this book, and so is my hand. Those are all hypostases because I can tell that they're distinct. I can tell the difference between them set them side by side. Um, so it's, in, as far as that goes, it's a pretty non-technical word. Okay, um, As we noted before, the difficulty with the Latin and Latins and Greeks understanding each other is that hypostasis is the exact equivalent of the Latin word substance, which really throws the Latins for a loop. This is where Hilary of Poitiers does a lot of work. Um, notice, if you look at the middle of this, paragraph here. Um, well, let's just read through the thing. For we must keep our minds stayed, so to say, on a certain underlying matter, that's the usia, and by forming a clear impression of its distinguishing properties, so arrive at the end desired. For suppose we do not bethink us of the fatherhood, nor bear in mind him of whom this distinctive quality is marked off, how can we take in the idea of God the Father? If you don't have some idea about God the Father being distinct, how can you really have the idea of him being a father? Right? For merely to enumerate the differences of persons, prosopa, which is what something that you see, a, a, an appearance or a... Um, um, it, it can mean a mask, but it also means, you know, what someone looks like when you look at them. You know, if you look at yourself in the mirror, you see your prosopon. That's what you, that's what 
what is in front of the face of someone who is looking at you. Um, that's what you see. That um, merely to enumerate the differences of persons, prosopa, is important. We must confess each person to have real existence. Um, there is going later between Cyril and Nestorius to be a fight over what's the right word to use for the three. Cyril is perfectly happy with prosopon, and here it is in Basil's word. Cyril's going to, Nestorius is perfectly happy with prosopon. Um, Cyril's going to make a very intelligent argument that prosopon isn't good enough. We really should only use hypostasis. So one of the things we see in this this passage, this is one reason why I wanted to show this to you, is both that Basil, when he's talking about this, is perfectly coherent. He's trying to say, look, we've got to have a word for the three and a word for the one, and we've got to understand how they both are true at the same time. But he doesn't really care if you use the word prosopon or hypostasis. Two generations later, 60 years later in, um, in the, or 50 years later in 431, because we go 381, 431, 451, 50 years later, um, Cyril will demonstrate to the satisfaction of the Catholic stream of the church that we've got to let prosopon go and we've got to use hypostasis. So we see both the roots of the argument between Cyril and Nestorius and the fact that at this point, before the difficulties are raised, Basil's point is perfectly clear. Okay, It's very important to see. This tells you something about how theology develops. Right? <coughs> there is nothing wrong at the time that Basil writes this, 375. His idea is perfectly clear. We can understand it perfectly well. He's not making a choice between vocabulary because he doesn't have to yet. After there is more argument about what do you really mean about two natures, stuff like that, in Jesus, then the church's understanding will grow and they will get to the point where prosopon is no longer sufficient and they will settle on hypostasis. That shows both how, as the church's theological understanding grows more sophisticated, change is necessary but also how that does not erase the value and validity of good statements of faith at an earlier stage. It's very important to understand that. One of the things people will sometimes ask you is, if the church's theology is always developing and we're always moving into greater truth, right? doesn't that mean that everything we used to say is no good? And the answer is no, it does not. But you have to understand it um, as belonging to its own time. And here, this passage um, to Amphilochius of Iconium, um, in the next page, 83, this is a classic passage for the distinction between usia and hypostasis. Usia is the general, the general nature of divinity, he says, is what you want to call um, all three, you know, was what you want to call the Godhead, the Trinity shares the divine usia. But the hypostasis, which is the three, is what you would call each individual. So the example is that you would, you know, you would call, um, you know, in the same way that human, individual human beings, John, Bob, and Charlie are each hypostases, they're each single examples of something, but what they share is what makes them all examples of men, which is to say the nature of being divine, the usia of being divine. Um, some people have argued ever since Basil wrote this passage, starting immediately, people have argued ever since, does him using this example of animal and particular man, you know, that contrast as being an example of what he's talking about, does that mean that he is, that the Cappadocians are tritheists because we are separate individuals? And the Catholic tradition has answered no. 
because his example is one that exists on the physical level. If we say um, John, Bob, and Charlie, they are physically, they are separate because they are physically individual. Whereas with a purely spiritual, purely non-physical being like God, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost are distinct. You can distinguish them one from another, but they cannot be separate. The way John, Bob, and Charlie, you know, John can stay here and Charlie can go next door and Bob can go to a movie, right? But Father, Son, and Holy Ghost being omnipresent and ubiquitous as God is everywhere and at all times, they're, they're never separate. They're, they're never separated like that. God the Father never goes someplace and the Son isn't there. They're all always everywhere. So on a certain level, this is a useful distinction, but if you push it too far, then you end up with a misunderstanding of it. So the church has said, um, if you naively take this as an example, then of course you end up with an idea of sort of, you know, an old guy, young guy, and a dove. Right? But that's not what he's saying. He's talking about completely spiritual beings. So the church has said this is a, um, this is a perfectly uh, acceptable way of talking about the mystery. And as a matter of fact, what other kind of metaphor are you going to use if you're, if you're trying to talk about general and particular to people who are not philosophically trained? You have to take something that they know. And um, as a matter of fact, very likely with this passage and other ones like it from Basil in Mind, um, in the theological orations, Gregory stops for a minute and says, no, wait a sec. One of the things we need to realize is that when people make, when people make examples of things when they're doing theology, when people may say it's like this, or for example, you know, this, or they use something metaphorically, he says, it's only fair to take the example or simile or metaphor as far as the person intends it to go, that any example or simile or metaphor can be pushed to the point where you destroy what the person is trying to say. And if you do that, you are not pointing out a difficulty in the person's idea, you are destroying the person's idea. So he says, because of the, this all relates to their struggles with language. This is the, this is the period in which the church is beginning to clearly demonstrate to itself what it means when you say that human language is by its nature insufficient to fully capture the mystery of God. It doesn't mean you can't say something which is accurate, but it does mean you can't say something that encapsulates all of the truth. So saying, there's one who see a, you know, that the Trinity has one divine nature, but that it has three hypostases, three things, Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Or in Latin, you say there's one substance and three persons, right? That that's, Those are perfectly acceptable ways of talking, but you have to know how far they go and where they leave off being useful. So um, one of the things the Catholic tradition takes from passages like these is a, a very careful understanding of theological modesty. And this is, of course, you know, here, this is Stevenson, who's teaching doctrine at Oxford. And so the next thing he gives you in 84, which I also had you read, is, an, is our knowledge of God is imperfect. We can say true things, but we can't say everything. It's very important because the anhomoians, in the second line here, do you worship what you know and what you, or what you know not? If I answer, I worship what I know. They, the anhomoians, the unlikers, immediately reply, what is the essence of the object of worship? Eunomius of Sisychus, who was one of the most prominent and Homoians very famously said we have some of his writings not as much as we'd like but some of his writings survive and very famously he said the essence of the father this is you know they're arguing over Trinity right the essence of the father he says is to be unbegotten 
the essence of this when we say that the father is unbegotten that is a definition in the hard sense of what the father is the father is unbegottenness that is his essence he says when we say that we know as much about the father's nature as he knows about it himself because we know it is unbegottenness in other words the Cappadocian fathers were arguing against people who said, no, we can say things that are fully true and completely sufficient about God. And the Catholic tradition via the Cappadocian fathers responds to them, no, we can say things that are completely true, but we cannot say things that are sufficient, that encapsulate the nature of God. And that's a tremendously important distinction because, as I've said all the way through this, one of the things that comes out of this Aryan controversy is the conviction on the part of Catholic Christians that there is no such thing as a formula of words, no matter how many you use, that says everything that is true about God, that holds God in its hand, that defines God in the sense that people commonly use the word. That is not possible because of the nature of God and the nature of language. And it's very important to realize that they were arguing against people, some people, who said, yes, it is possible. Because that not only includes a very different idea of what language is able to do, but a completely different idea of God. God is not a mystery to the Anhomoyans. God is not beyond them in the sense of what they can know. And the church said, eek, when it heard that. No, that's not what we mean. Um, okay. So we end with uh, three minutes left. We end with this wonderful little treatise um, by Gregory of Nyssa, which is translated into English in the Library of Christian Classics. Um, its, its real name is To Oblabius, because he writes it to a man named Oblabius. To Oblabius on why we do not say there are three gods. And what he's trying to do is, he's trying to talk about the fact, yes, there are three, but we're not trithiists. Because these persons are not... They're not separate the way things we know are separate, right? Um, he says, if you look at, well, look at the bottom paragraph um, on page 125. In speaking of cause and of the cause, because, of course, the Father is the cause of the Son and Spirit. He's the source. We do not by these words denote nature. In other words, the Father does not have the nature of unbegottenness, which the Son and the Spirit don't have. This is directly against the Animoians, right? They say, no, they have different natures. They have unbegottenness, begottenness, and processional, processionality, or however you're going to do it in English. And so, therefore, they're, th they're th three different be kinds of being. And the Catholics say no. And speaking of cause and of the cause, we do not by these words denote nature, for no one would give the same definition of cause and of nature. We indicate the difference in the manner of existence. When we say one is caused and the other is without cause, the caused one is the son, who's begotten by the father, and nobody begets the father, so he's without cause, right? We do not divide the nature of the word cause, we only indicate the fact that the son does not exist without generation, nor the father by generation. But we must needs in the first place believe that something exists, and then scrutinize the manner of the existence of the object of belief. In other words, he says, our language is just trying to represent what we believe to be true about things that are already there. We're not creating anything by our language. We're trying to describe things that are already there. And the truth is our language 
isn't really able to do that. When we say Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, and the Father begets the Son, and the Son is begotten by the Father, and the Spirit proceeds from the Father, and the Father sends forth the Spirit, we're talking about the fact that they are distinct, they are distinguishable, but we are not talking about them being different like, you know, cats are fuzzy and eggs are not. That's, you know, so that we have, so they're different in their nature. We're talking about how they are distinct, not how they are separate. How they are distinguishable, not how they are dividable. You can't divide them into categories and say, you know, the Father is one thing and the Son is another thing and the Spirit's another thing. They're distinguishable, but they're all one nature. And so um, this also, while claiming that we know true things about the persons of the Trinity, is also at the same time an argument for theological modesty. In the end, the great, I believe, the great distinction, religious distinction, between certainly the Neo-Aryans, the Anhomoians, and the Catholics, is the distinction between modest theology and what you could call, what we would call immodest theology, or overly optimistic theology. Um, Ephraim the Syrian uh, makes this same argument as the Cappadocian Fathers. Uh, it's very interesting. Um, now you don't need to read my dissertation. Um, Ephraim the Syrian and Gregory Nazianzus reading, as far as we can tell, roughly the same Aryan writers in different languages, of course, make the same argument against them without having any contact with each other and without any knowledge that the other person is doing that. And they make the same argument against them because inherent in the Catholic tradition is this understanding of theological modesty and the, the distance, the unbridgeable distance between what God is and what we can say and know about him, which is one of the primary characteristics of the Catholic theological tradition. That's what I think I demonstrated when I compared them as arguers against the Arians, and that's why this three or four selection sequence that we just looked at is so important because it demonstrates that there are basic religious convictions about human nature, divine nature, and the difference between us as creatures and God as creator that are built into our theological tradition that were not held by all people who were claiming to be Christians um, during this controversy. It was a hard-won part of Christian doctrine. And we need to be more aware of it and um, teach it more fully in order for people to understand the mystery at the heart of the Christian faith, which is a tremendously important part of our um, scriptural and liturgical and religiously one knowledge of God. Thank you very much.